An issue widely acknowledged and grave, yet silently accepted, is the considerable failure of modern school education. Students attend school not to acquire genuine skills or shape their personalities, but to pass exams, obtain qualifications, and progress to the next level of the game. The ultimate goal of this game is employment, but the concern is which job the school education can secure for you, rather than teaching you practical skills. On one hand, there's a plethora of university graduates struggling to find jobs, realizing they lack practical skills. On the other hand, employers complain about the difficulty of finding individuals who can truly contribute. Universities seem more like intelligence filters than empowering institutions. So, what's wrong? One striking realization from reading Annie Murphy Paul's The Extended Mind is that the failure of school education is alarmingly normal. Teachers lecturing from textbooks, while dozens of students attempt to understand, followed by tests focusing on textbook content. This method is peculiar if it were truly effective in imparting practical skills. It contradicts the cognitive nature of the brain. Modern teaching methods are not optimized for facilitating student learning. They are tailored for efficient school management, easy delegation for teachers, and mass-producing young individuals to enter society in a standardized, safe, and cost-effective manner. Schools teach not mathematics but types of math problems, not art but art theory, not programming but programming classes. How much real understanding one gains from this is subjective. The school's primary concern is safely advancing you to the next level. This is not genuine education. It's the alienation of education. You've probably sensed this, so what can be done? Paul's book provides clues to the right way of education. In the previous discussion, we explored how the brain's performance highly depends on the surrounding environment. Now, let's talk about one crucial environment that influences the brain the most. One that everyone in society must face. The presence of others. Our brains naturally thrive on interaction, and proper education requires engagement. The most natural teaching method humans have known since ancient times is apprenticeship. The master demonstrates, the apprentice follows, and then the apprentice dives into real work, starting with simple tasks and gradually progressing to more complex ones. This method is simple, yet incredibly rare today. Many practical skills can only be mastered by doing, because a significant portion of knowledge is inexpressible in language. Research shows that experts can articulate only about 30% of what they actually know. For example, asking a surgeon to describe how to insert a shunt into the femoral artery may lead to unintentional omission of 70% of the procedure. Learning by imitation is more efficient, and apprenticeship allows for the most effective learning. For instance, in writing, instead of pondering various writing theories, it's often more beneficial to imitate high-quality works and seek guidance from a teacher. The only drawback to apprenticeship is its high cost. It requires a one-on-one -on -one teaching scenario, and the teacher must genuinely be skilled, not a textbook reader mass-produced by a teacher training university. However, AI is likely to soon provide assistance in this regard, or perhaps it already can serve as a mentor. Another solution exists. Another approach is the discussion method, where students learn from each other. A physicist's discovery is noteworthy in this context. Carl Wieman awarded the 2021 Nobel Prize in Physics for experimentally verifying the Bose-Einstein condensation phenomenon, was also interested in physics education. Facing the challenge of how to make students think like physicists, he attempted various methods of explaining physics concepts without success. Then, he had an epiphany. Wieman's graduate students, when they first joined the research group, didn't know how to conduct research. They possessed standardized physics knowledge, but they struggled to connect that knowledge to actual research. This phenomenon is familiar to Chinese readers. Students with excellent exam scores may not excel in research, and those engaged in research may not perform well in exams. Fortunately, undergraduate education, despite its many flaws, is still effective for research in good universities, because it often follows the apprenticeship model. However, Wieman discovered that the research skills of the students in his group were not primarily taught by him. He didn't spend every day personally teaching students how to conduct research. Yet, within one or two years of joining the group, students would gain insights and start conducting research. How was this possible? 
It turns out they learned from their fellow students in the lab, or engaged in mutual discussions. The laboratory serves as an environment for practical work. Observing others, imitating, asking questions, and engaging in conversations. All these activities contribute to learning. A 2019 study specifically proved Weeman's insight. The intellectual progress of graduate science students over four years is mainly influenced by interactions with peers, not guidance from mentors. Weeman used this insight to create a discussion-based teaching method. He had undergraduate physics students sit in groups during each class, discussing and even debating the content while the professor provided necessary clarification. This more active learning method proved to be highly effective. This method's applicability is not limited to scientific studies. Research suggests that nurses and hospitals learn many practical skills from their colleagues, especially when someone shares their experiences handling emergencies. These are valuable experiences not found in textbooks. The most crucial aspect of discussion-based learning might not be the discussion itself, but the social aspect. The cognitive processes and neural activities of the brain differ when in a social state compared to a solitary state. Engaging in a conversation requires predicting the other person's next statement, organizing a response, and activating various regions of the brain, making it more active, flexible, and detailed. More brain areas are activated, and more connections are formed. Additionally, you can leverage the brain's social coding. There's a dedicated region in the brain for storing social information, making us more sensitive to social cues, enhancing memory accuracy, and increasing calculation speed. This serves a similar function to the spatial sense discussed in the previous section. You can anchor new information to social coding, deepening impressions, and speeding up processing. This explains why a logical question presented in mathematical form is challenging but when packaged within a social context, it becomes more accessible. It also highlights the significant difference in brain activity between playing chess against a computer and playing against a human. Research indicates that when playing against a human, brain areas related to planning, anticipation, and empathy are more active. If you win, the reward-related brain area is more strongly activated. This is why, despite knowing that AI has surpassed human chess players, we still love watching human chess matches. We genuinely appreciate human experiences. Given this, we should increase, rather than decrease, the social attributes of learning. In fact, you've known this for a while. Teaching language to infants is most effective when an adult is present, engaging with eye contact and gestures. Interestingly, if older siblings often teach younger siblings, not only does it benefit the younger ones, but the older ones also gain advantages. Research shows that firstborn children tend to have an average intelligence 2.3 points higher than their younger siblings, primarily because they benefit from teaching their siblings. For more formal education, letting older students tutor younger ones has shown positive results worldwide. Even if the older student initially struggles with their studies, the tutoring activity benefits them significantly. Their grades improve, attendance increases and the likelihood of advancing to higher education also rises. This is because when you try to teach someone else, your brain is stimulated by social interaction. You enter a vibrant alert mode, become more attentive, and enhance memory. You have to fill in knowledge gaps, discover deep connections between concepts, and face the challenge of students' questions. You are compelled to truly understand what you are teaching. Even if no one is learning from you directly, recording a teaching video for yourself, pretending to be a teacher, can still yield significant results. Another method is having students work in teams for debates. With roles assigned and research conducted individually, they collectively present their findings during debates. They become highly motivated to learn in order to win the debate. The effectiveness of this method is not just due to the motivation from the competition. It is because humans inherently enjoy using reason to win arguments. If learning can increase social interaction, can work also do the same? Work inherently involves social interaction. Paul introduces a new term in her book called socially distributed cognition, which involves thinking with the ideas of others, extending the boundaries of cognitive analysis beyond individual bodies, and viewing a team as a cognitive and computational system. Consider steering a massive cargo ship. 
Faced with complex situations at sea, no single person can control the ship effectively. However, with several people working together, coordinating well, having clear roles, and communicating smoothly, ideally reaching a kind of collective flow, they can navigate skillfully. Distributed cognition requires knowledge not stored in one person's mind, but scattered across individuals managing different domains of knowledge. Decision-making is not led by one person, but by collective intelligence. However, this collective wisdom cannot be achieved through simple voting. It requires brainstorming and forming organic chemical reactions. This is incredibly challenging. Long-term coordination, synchronous training, shared physiological arousal, a sense of group identity, and perhaps even some ritualistic practices may be necessary. But all these efforts are worthwhile because modern society increasingly demands intellectual collaboration among individuals. In summary, the brain is not an isolated machine. Its performance is closely tied to our physical state, environment, and interactions with others. The various methods mentioned in Paul's book to enhance cognitive abilities can be categorized into two approaches. One is reducing cognitive load. Just as you'd close unnecessary programs to free up more computing power, eliminating distractions, reducing tasks that consume brain power, and minimizing cognitive burdens is easy to understand. The other is providing cognitive handles. This is a bit counterintuitive. Why do actions like using a larger monitor, walking, and social interaction, which involve more physical movement, result in better brain performance? It's because these additional actions not only don't occupy cognitive resources, but also provide anchoring points for new information, assisting in thinking and memory. In reality, none of these methods are entirely novel. If you observe how Confucius and his disciples interacted in teaching, how literate individuals in ancient times had dedicated study rooms, and wealthy families even had secret rooms, and how apprenticeship was prevalent, compare this with modern school education and cubicle-style offices. We have ample reasons to believe that the various alienations of the brain, since the advent of widespread education and the popularity of brain-intensive work are just a brief episode in human history we will soon return to a more natural way of using our brains. If you feel there is value in this, please like, subscribe to this channel, and leave your thoughts or suggestions in the comments section. Let's grow together and read more good books.